And uh, a few days ago, I tweeted out an article about Jimmy Carter. I have my disagreements with President Carter, but as an ex-president, he's been pretty admirable. So I tweeted out an article about him, and somebody pointed out that the, the headline uh, featured the fact that uh, he lives a modest life, but did so by pointing out, among other things, that he shops at dollar stores. And it turns out... Uh, that uh, one of the guests we've had on the program before uh, wrote a very interesting and informative article. She co-wrote it with another writer about the dollar store's phenomenon and its significance. It's interesting. It's extremely important. It touches on, in my mind, a variety of uh, important social policy issues uh, we're struggling with today. So I invited her back to talk about it, and she kindly agreed. Stacy Mitchell is, uh, let me get this right, she is the co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. She directs its Community Scaled Economy Initiative, which produces research and analysis and, and partners with a range of allies to design and implement policies that curb economic consolidation, among other things, and that is a big part of the dollar store's story. So she joins us Joins us once again now, Stacey Mitchell. Thanks for coming back on the program. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thank you. So, first of all, this was a great article. You co-wrote it with uh, Marie Donahue for the Institute for Sol uh, Local Self-Reliance. Headline, dollar stores are targeting struggling urban neighborhoods and small towns, and God knows there are enough of those. Uh, one community is showing how to fight back. So, first of all, for people who might not know, what, is, what are the dollar stores? Yeah. Well, Dollar Stores, uh, and there are two dominant chains. There's Dollar General and Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree owns Family Dollar and as well as the Dollar Tree brand. So these two chains have over 60% of the dollar store market. And these are largely um, sort of, they're often referred to as small box discount stores. So they're relatively small, like sort of uh, chain pharmacy sized stores that sell uh, a limited selection of mostly packaged and processed foods along with household goods of various kinds. Uh, and these stores have multiplied quite rapidly. Uh, they grew during the financial crisis and we found they have actually grown even faster in the years since the financial crisis. So you have these stores, um, you, so you have these stores uh, located in all these um, uh, communities, uh, primarily, I guess, lower income communities, and they sell, you know, as the name might imply, cheap things, and they also sell a small and rather, you know, grim assortment of food items. Uh, but as you p point out in, in your article, uh, a lot of them are located in food deserts or places where. Uh, healthy shopping, uh, grocery shopping is not available. So this kind of Spartan choice of foods that they offer may be the only food available to people in these neighborhoods. And you say, if I recall correctly, uh, that they now feed more Americans, for example, than Whole Foods. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, we sort of use the Whole Foods analogy not to say that we think people should shop at Whole Foods or that that's the ideal in, in the grocery world. It's an expensive chain owned by Amazon. So I, I'm not advocating that that's uh, what we should have for groceries, but rather as a way to sort of point out that for, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, relatively well-off people living in coastal metro areas for the news media, Whole Foods looms pretty large as a grocer in the imagination and in the coverage of the grocery sector. You know, you think of Whole Foods as a pretty significant player. Um, and so by pointing out to people that the reality is that more Americans are getting their grocery stores, uh, groceries from these dollar chains was a way to really dramatize the fact that we now kind of live in a, in a geography in which, you know, there are relatively relatively few neighborhoods and communities that are doing well, and you'll find Whole Foods there. And then there are a lot of places that are doing quite poorly, and many people, in fact, are relying on dollar stores 
for their groceries, even though dollar stores, uh, by and large, do not sell any fresh produce or fresh meats. It's all packaged food. So it's a, a pretty bad place to have to do your shopping. Um, what's interesting about the growth of the dollar stores we found is that they're incredibly, they're in incredibly dense numbers in the places that they're going into. So these regions that they have targeted, these small towns and these urban neighborhoods, they're, um, you know, often like dozens of them kind of, they'll be, you know, right across the street from one another or a few blocks away. So they come in at this just incredible density. And we found that they're particularly targeting, you know, when they look at the their future growth, um, they see this, you know, their, their profitability depends in some respects on there being a permanent underclass mm -hmm. in the U.S. And so when they look for uh, where they think that underclass is going to be, the two places that they see it um, are certain urban neighborhoods, particularly African-American neighborhoods we found, and also these very small rural communities um, that are struggling economically. And, you know, I guess that the last thing I will say is, is that it's easy to see dollar chains as a symptom of the economic problems, a symptom of uh, the poverty and the growing inequality in our country. But what we found that I think is really crucial is that these stores aren't simply a symptom, they're actually a cause of economic distress. And that's what we think uh, communities and policymakers really need to focus on. And I, and I think I, I I think that's a very important point that I want to talk about further. But uh, the, the one thing that I want to say before I get off this Whole Foods thing is that I also found it to be an evocative statistic for this reason, Stacey Mitchell, because it, it, it highlighted for me how many of us who think we're in touch with the pulse of what's going on with people in this country are actually in our own kind of islands of plenty where it wouldn't occur to us that more people might be uh, served by dollar stores for their food buying than served by Whole Foods. I think it's important for people to be reminded on a visceral level that there is an ocean of uh, people out there in this country who are, in fact, struggling with what might become permanent underclass status. So I think the magnitude of the problem is important for people to understand. And then I think you raise an important, a vitally important point as well, which is a sort of causality, the chain of causality behind this that, you know, somebody might look and say, well, you know, they've got a strong, smart strategy. There are going to be a lot of struggling people in this country for the indefinite future. But the fact is they perhaps, as in the retail space, in another way, a wall, it might be said that a Walmart does, they may, they may in fact be, and I think you're arguing they are contributing to that underclass uh, that they're profiting off of. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. How, do, how does that happen? Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the communities that we looked at was the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and Tulsa has over 50 dollar stores within the city limits. Um, and many of those dollar stores are clustered on the north side of Tulsa, which is the historically black uh, part of the city. And in North Tulsa, there are no grocery stores for miles and miles. Um, and there are lots of dollar stores. And so what the clustering of these dollar stores has meant is that it's very hard for a legitimate grocer to come in and set up shop there because the market is so saturated with dollar stores that there's hardly any room for um, another grocer to be successful. And if you combine this with the fact that, you know, sort of other dimensions of this problem, we know, for example, that because of consolidation and banking, there are fewer community banks. And that means that there's been less availability of loans for small businesses. And so one of the challenges for, you know, that's contributing to food deserts is the fact that local entrepreneurs who would like to start grocery stores in some of these communities are just unable to get loans because they're independent local businesses and there are no longer networks of community banks that do that kind of lending. And then the other problem is that, and this has been well documented in academic literature, is that some of the supermarket chains 
basically redline. I mean, they bypass low-income black neighborhoods and they choose not to locate stores there. Um, so you've got these dynamics and then you combine that with the dollar stores clustering and kind of, you know, sort of strangling and, and, and taking up all the oxygen, if you will, and not leaving any room for a new grocer. Um, so that's an example of what's happening in urban neighborhoods, and we see almost a parallel in small towns where Dollar General will open in a community that maybe has, you know, a, s a small town that has one uh, typically locally owned grocery store, often multi-generation family owned business in Iowa or some other, you know, small town in the Midwest, Dollar General will come in and they will take 30% of the sales of that local grocery store, and even though the grocery store is still winning the competition. I mean, they're still doing 70% of the business. Um, you know, they they losing just enough revenue to put them in the red and eventually they have to close. And then, then everybody in that community has the choice of either going to Dollar General for their groceries or driving in some cases uh, quite some distance to another town to go to a real grocery store. And by the way, uh, and again, we're talking to Stacey Mitchell of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I'm speaking to you from a food desert now in southeastern Washington, D.C. There isn't a grocery store, uh, I believe, within a mile and a half of where I am now. And it would be public transportation and changing buses and so on to get to one. Uh, so it's a very real phenomenon, and it, it contributes to uh, poor nutrition, it contributes, it exacerbates other problems caused uh, by uh, lack of income or in low-income com communities and so on. So it's a serious and ongoing problem, and in effect, you know, by driving other stores out of business combined, I think, if I understand what you're saying correctly, combined with the redlining that goes on with the big chains, it leaves people with, uh, and, and I would imagine, by the way, these stores can operate with very low overhead, you know, the rents uh, may not be high. Um, so, in other words, they're create. I think you're saying they're creating the problem that they're then, or exacerbating the problem that they're then profiting from. I guess the question would be then, how do we break that? How do we uh, do something about this? It seems like a problem with its tentacles and so many different issues that how do you go about fighting something like this? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, communities at the local level have a lot of authority through their zoning. And so one of the things that we did in our report was talk about some of the ways that, that communities can use that authority to control the proliferation of dollar stores. You don't have to, as a local community, you don't have to accept a dollar store. Um, and you certainly don't have to accept them in the numbers that they uh, want to open in some of these neighborhoods. So Tulsa is a, a good story of a place where the, the city councilwoman who represents North Tulsa um, um, has led community activists in a process and they succeeded earlier this year in passing an ordinance that prohibits a new dollar store coming in if it's going to be within one mile of an existing dollar store. And the other nice part of that story is through their activism in passing that ordinance, they helped spur the Tulsa Economic Development uh, Corporation has got this project where they're now in the process of trying to bring a local grocer um, that would be operated locally um, into the neighborhood. Um, that process is still underway, so we'll see you know, how that plays out and whether that's successful, but it looks like this neighborhood's gonna finally get a grocery store and they've put a cap on new dollar stores coming in. So that's one example. Um, we also know of places that have, have put limits on all formula businesses, which are you know sort of all chains. Um, San Francisco has done that in a number of neighborhoods. Jersey City has done it as well. Um, so there are tools like that that local governments can use to actually limit the ability of these uh, companies to come in or to put restrictions on when and where they can uh, where they can open. Uh, at the bigger picture level, I think we also, um, you know, at the federal level and, and at the state level, need to think more about how do we solve the food desert problem in a constructive way. And some of that means that we've got to deal with income inequality, that we need to raise people's incomes. 
um, that's part of the problem. And so, you know, there are lots of different policy strategies we might talk about on that front. But more specifically on how do we get more grocery stores serving these communities, there's some really great um, examples of programs that have really worked. Um, one we talk about in the report is the Pennsylvania Fresh Food Financing Initiative. And this was a program that operated for about 10 years, uh, starting in 2004 until about 2014, and succeeded in through a, a mostly a loan program, but also some grants in financing nearly a hundred uh, locally owned grocery stores that opened in underserved both urban and rural uh, communities in Pennsylvania. And almost all of those stores have gone on to be successful. So it's a program that really demonstrates that the problem in many cases is capital, the lack of capital access for local entrepreneurs, not that businesses can't be successful uh, in these neighborhoods. Um, so there are solutions out there. Uh, I, you know, I also think we need to think more about uh, antitrust policy and sort of the ability of chains like uh, Dollar General and Dollar Tree to continue to merge. I mean, these, these companies are part of a pattern of mergers and, and acquisitions over the years that have given them the kind of size and market power that they have. Um, and maybe we need to think uh, more about whether those types of mergers should be approved in the future. Well, I think there's all great ideas, and I'm glad you guys are working on this. I keep thinking, Stacey, that there's a, a, a catchy, you know, we don't want your dollars, we want change or something, but I can't come up with it. I'll keep working on it. But it is a, it is a serious issue. It's a critical issue. It has to do with people's health as well as their wealth. And I'm glad you wrote about it. I'm glad you're working on it. And Stacy Mitchell of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, thanks for coming back on the program. Thank you.